evening and I apologize for the delay. Welcome to this evening's Northwest Allen County School uh, Board of Trustees uh, School Board meeting. Um, we call this morning meeting to order. We'll start off with uh, Dr. Hemsel making a statement regarding the subsequent uh, board meetings. Yeah, we just want to let those people who have taken the time to uh, live stream to know that we are in the transitioning back to our normal routine. We will live stream our next meeting, which will be the second meeting of July on July 27th. And then beginning in August, we'll go back to our normal routine for school board meetings. Um, we will also be, tonight we're at Maple Creek. We will also return to Perry Hill um, as soon as their const uh, construction project concludes, which may be for the next meeting. It definitely should be by August 10th. Thank you very much. So with that, we'll go right into our agenda. The first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes covering our June 22nd regular meeting. Do I have a motion for approval? Move for approval. Second. Okay. Motion by Mr. Felker, second by Mr. Barkins. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's carried. Please note, Lisa, that we do have Ms. Schlatter online this evening and with voting and participating in the uh, voting uh, pursuant to the governor's ruling on allowing online governance. And now we'll go into personal communication with Dr. Gibson. Yeah, I recommend your approval this evening, the communication personnel and communications items A through H in your respective packets. So a motion for items A through H. Second. Motion by Ms. Hathaway, second by Mr. Felker. Are there any questions or comments on items A through H? had heard that was uh, the uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Grimm and Mr. Cromiller uh, retirement noting their years of service uh, to the community and students of Fort Worth Town. Are there any other questions or comments regarding items A through H? Hearing none, we'll go to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. I also recommend for your approval this evening the professional learning activities item I in your respective packets. A uh, motion for professional learning uh, training activity in item I. Second. Motion by Ms. Hathaway, second by Mr. Barkas. Any questions or comments on that item? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. Also request permission to accept the donations on behalf of our special education for our special education students. That includes a $350 um, four bean system or a four bean system valued at $350 from Share Your Blessings. A Ripton gate trainer valued at $1,300 and a Phantom Easy Stand Standard valued at $1,500 being donated by the Maddox Belay family, and a Mulholland Gate Trainer valued at $500 from the Sherry Showdown family. Move for approval. Second. Motion by Mr. Marcus, second by Ms. Hathaway. Uh, any questions or comments on those donations? I'm assuming they're shared throughout the entire district and not just this one side location. Wherever it is need be. Yeah, these would be wherever need be, but these are specific to um, things that typically come up in our special needs classrooms, which are at Eel River, currently at Huntertown, and then Carroll Middle School and Carroll High School. And then the programs at Huntertown and one of the programs at Eel River will move to Aspen Meadow and it'll be um, Eel River, Aspen Meadow, Carroll Middle School, and Carroll High School in the future. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on the donations? All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's carried. I'll go to the superintendent's report. Yeah. Before I get to our resolution, I thought I would give some more background uh, as to where we're at to kind of get you guys an update. And I know I've shared this with you before, but I wanted to go through formally. Actually, we've been sharing a little bit of it at the end of each of our board meetings here recently. Um, first of all, before I begin, 
I do want to note, as has been the case since we closed on March 13th, we have been working to try to be open. Um, even though remote learning allowed us to do something that um, to get us through an unprecedented time, we recognize that in-person and on-site instruction is the best that we can do and it is best for children. Um, we also recognize that we still have some parents who still have some legitimate concerns that they have, and so we're trying to work through and how to accommodate those parents while also still working for city reopening. I also want to let you know, we are not, as hard as it is sometimes, we're not being dictated by what's going on in the political environment or the social media environment with the emotion. What we're trying to do is follow the advice of our local medical and public health experts We've been working with the doctors who are part of the Allen County Public Health Board, as well as pediatricians and occupational health specialists. Uh, there are some specific ones that we've been at with at Parkview, but there's a number of doctors that have been very gracious with their time and helping us understand. And many of those doctors also have kids in our district and have a well-vested interest in making sure we do this safely because their kids would be subject to any of the things that we do. We also want to remind you, as we've been told by numerous of all those experts, we're not going to be able to prevent a case from ever occurring. But what we can do is we can take steps to minimize the impact on what happens in our different buildings. So, for example, once we reopen it, the easy part is to reopen. The hard part is staying open without having to close on a regular basis. And we want to avoid that. The steps that we're getting ready to go over are just some brief overview, some things that are on there um, to help us prevent needing to close and have interruptions throughout the year, but increase the chances that we can stay open and minimize how many cases we have. Um, that's what we're trying to get done. Um, doing none of the things that you see up here will, what the doctors have told us is we will have more cases, and if we have more cases, we will be closed more often. And that's what we want to try to avoid. That's what we're trying to stop. So some of the things that we've been talking about and where we're at in the process is we're in the weeds. We're past the big picture stuff and we're to the minute details. And we are taking advantage of the fact that we are one of the last places to open. Um, many other schools actually begin in about two weeks of opening. There are going to be some other schools locally that are going to have their plans approved later this week. All of those schools start before we do. And so they don't have the luxury of being able to wait and learn from others as much as what we have. We've been looking at our physical spaces in terms of entrances and exits, HVAC and those types of things. We've been talking about the primary delivery space. And the two spaces that are the most of concern is what do we do with classrooms? What do we do with buses? Those are the two most complicated that we have to worry about. The public spaces, such as the cafeteria like we're in now, the gymnasium, lobbies, the hallways, other places that are shared periodically, also present challenges. But those spaces are used less often during the school day than the classrooms and, and buses. The semi-public spaces is where we get into like workrooms and, and so forth, where they're public to the employees, but they're not public to everyone else, so they're kind of a quasi or semi-public. And then we, of course, have our outdoor spaces, where we start talking about the playgrounds, the group to and from the buses into the building and so forth that we have to think through. And then we have to think about supplies and equipment that are shared. It's simply not realistic for us to have, with the budgets that we have to live with then, to have an individual set of supplies and equipment for all nearly 8,000 children that we serve. It's simply not feasible unless our budgets were to be expanded by a tremendous amount, and I do not see that happening any time in the future, or at least not the near future. Going back to the occupational health people we've talked about, we talked about hierarchy of controls. The first one is the most effective is just to remove people from the situation. We're gonna talk about the number one strategy we have, Six people stay at home. That is the absolute best solution we have. If sick people are not in the building, then that means we don't have to worry about the spread of the disease. The problem is this disease is complicated because you can spread it before you start showing symptoms. And that's what makes this a little bit harder to deal with. 
isolate people away from the situation, which is where you get into social distancing. And that's why we've heard so much about social distancing dating all the way back to people. Administrator control are the ones that we have the most control over. Those are things such as our cleaning procedures, hygiene procedures, different things like that that we can control. And then the least effective, but yet still necessary, is when we get into personal protective equipment or the engineering aspect. So what we've learned from the democrats, and this is continually changed, and this slide is very different than the one that I did back in February, because we continue to learn more and more about this, is predominantly passing, apparently, through the air, through airborne particles. And so back when we first started, I think we had the surfaces up at the top. Now the positions have moved the surfaces down near the bottom. This slide has been changing, so we will be referring back to the CDC and other Indiana State Department of Health, the Allen County Department of Health, as these things get up. Our number one strategy, again, as I said, is for sick people to stay at home. That sounds very simple, but it's much more complicated in reality because parents live a life of practicality and sometimes their kid, they send their kid to school and they put a couple of time off and they go to work. Unfortunately, when we're dealing with COVID, it adds an additional layer of complexity to that because we do know that we have vulnerable people in our buildings that we have to care for and we need to keep away from particular virus. So we're going to be doing a lot of educating about the symptoms. Um, we're going to have to encourage people to have alternate plans. That goes for teachers in terms of alternate lesson plans. That goes for parents in terms of what to do when their child is sick and to make sure they have backup plans. We're going to have to take a look at our attendance procedures, which we have been looking at in a very detailed way, um, so that we encourage people who are sick not to come to school. Um, we may have to look at temporary access to remote learning or makeup work or ways so that kids don't fall behind if they're staying at home when they're sick. And we may have some kids miss more days than they typically do, but yet they still might be well enough to attend through the remote learning aspects. So we're gonna to have to figure out how to make that happen. We're gonna to have to have protocols within the building in case someone does come and is sick, comes to school sick, and we have a way of having them um, evaluated by the school nurse in a way with a part, our partnership with Parkview if we need to to involve Parkview if that becomes necessary. And then we have to have return to school and work protocols. Those are pretty much dictated by the Allen County Department of Health, which gets their information from the Indiana State Department of Health. It's basically a set of decision points and a decision tree, and you go through the decision tree, and they really don't have a lot of flexibility. However, we also anticipate that over time, those might be adjusted as we learn more and more and the conditions under which we're working change. But as of right now, those are dictated by the Indiana State Department of Health and the Allen County Department of Health has to follow up. We've also been looking at, in terms of paid time off and vaccinations for staff, I put vaccinations up there that's not for children, that's for staff in terms of what we do from an employee perspective. Um, we're having conversations with the association with them. We're also got guidance from the CARES Act and some different things like that um, that come in and dictate that. So we have to go through the proper discussion aspects of things um, to incorporate that. Some examples of some administrative controls. These are the ones that we have the most. The first one, isolation, that's social distancing for the most part. The administrative control are the other things we're taking a look at. We're looking at a clean hands in, clean hands out situation, which basically means every time you enter a space, you get some hand sanitizer or you stop by the bathroom and wash your hands prior to go in there. And then you do the same thing when you leave the space. So clean hands in, clean hands out. Safety drills, we're going to re-look at those if we're allowed by the state to do those on smaller scales so that we reduce having mass numbers of people interacting in the hallways or out to different places. So in other words, do we segment a particular group of classrooms on a fire drill instead of the entire building? Some of that is dictated by what the state will allow. If we're still working through those. But if we can segment and reduce how many people are involved in the drill at any one time, we will just so we reduce mass gatherings. Marks on the floor for social cueing 
especially with the little kids down in the act cafeteria. We'll probably have X's on the floor and some things like that to help remind kids how to make sure they keep the distance. Increasing the air filtration in our HVAC unit. We did have a consultant an engineer come out and take a look at our units. And what we're doing is instead of maximizing efficiency and cost for utility cost, along with keeping the air clean, slightly cleaner than what is needed by statute, we're increasing the filtration levels for this one year so that we have higher MERV levels and can filtrate out some of the more of the substance, more of the virus. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna maximize what our HVA systems are actually capable of handling. Because all of our HVA systems are different ages, they all have different MERV levels where it is their capacity. So we will move up to that maximum amount. So I do need to warn you that we're probably going to see a little bit of our HVAC um, systems increase in cost a little bit because you're going to be putting the air through higher filtration, which is going to put a little bit more of a, a burden on the system itself. Um, but we're going to try to do that for one year so we can get through this or until guidance from those agencies says that you no longer have to do that. Same thing with the number of air exchanges. We're going to increase the number of air exchanges where it's appropriate. But we have to be careful to make sure that we're not bringing in new allergens and new humidity. And so it's a balance that we have to work with, which is why we work with an engineer that specializes in this to find out the right balance of those kinds of things. We don't want to solve one problem and then create a different one. So that we're trying to reach the right balance there. In terms of the primary delivery spaces, we're looking at reducing unnecessary furniture. We have some teachers who create some very comfortable um, environments that may not be a year for us to do that so that we can just have more floor space and we can spread kids out a little bit more than what we typically do. We'll be doing what we do co-working, which is keeping groups of kids together. This goes back to the idea of reducing how many kids get quarantined. Um, if we are able to demonstrate that the space not have enough space to distance every child six feet apart by co the kids and keeping them together with seating charts and so forth, we can at least, if someone gets sick, is reduce how many kids in that particular group might be quarantined. If we don't do this, we would be the entire class that would end up needing to be quarantined. So this co-working is a way of reducing how many kids are within six feet of that child, which creates a situation in the decision tree that the Department of Health has to follow when it comes to giving direction about quarantine. At a minimum, we're going to put three feet between all of our workspaces, but we're going to try to be at more than six feet in all the spaces that we can. The reality of it is that with a 900 square foot classroom and with the class sizes that we are afforded to be able to do within the budgets we're provided, it's not possible to do that in every space. But in spaces where we can do it, we're going to have the desk and the workspaces six or more feet apart. And in the places where we can't, we're going to do cohorting, try to keep at least three feet and create a cohort where there's six feet between the cohorts. And that's what we're going to work with the occupational um, the occupational physician specialist to go in there and help us rethink some of the classroom space so that even though we can't have six feet between every child in there, we can create six feet between groups of kids and then within the groups of kids maximize their space between each other. And that's where they've really been helpful in having us think through things differently. We're going to encourage going outside whenever it's practical and it makes sense and the weather cooperates. First of all, it's just helping you to go outside, period. Um, and then by doing that, we, we, have less, we have more options and more flexibility on what we can do. Typically in the spring, we already do that because if we get to the spring, everybody likes getting, taking advantage of the nice weather. You'll probably see kids in using the outdoor spaces more often in the fall than what they will be done in the past, especially on nice days. We're going to consider, we're encouraging, if it's possible, to create a space in the classroom that is more than six feet apart so that if the kid needs to take a break from wearing a mask or the adult needs to take a break from wearing a mask, there's a space in the room where they can have a break. Um, because we've created a space that has the proper social distancing to be able to do that. The teachers will have to come up with some different rules to make sure all the kids have access to that. Um, so that's what we're encouraging all of our teachers to do if the space permits it to happen. And there will be some spaces that won't be possible. 
We're also going to create that the teacher create a space that's more than six feet apart for them to do some of their demonstrations or lectures or their informational pieces of it so that they can do so um, and also get a break and protect themselves. Um, the biggest fear that we've had throughout this entire process, based on the American Academy of Pediatrics, it has not been our littlest students, it's been our older students and the adults that we are most concerned with. And given the fact that we've been in a teacher shortage for several years, given the fact that we have some high risk or high, high vulnerability among some of our staff members, we're trying to keep them safe too, because if they're not able to come to work, it's not like we have lots of people out there that we can choose from to come and take the place. We're in a shortage situation and there aren't very many people. We've got to protect our employees as much as possible and keep them as healthy as we can throughout. The hardest part right now is how do we do effective teaching? The best type of teaching involves group work, hands-on, and collaborative types of things, lab work, and things like that. And we're still working through the details about how to do that as safe as possible. We don't want to throw all of the best teaching strategies out the window but how do we keep them in there in a way that makes sense and is still safe and conducive? And I will tell you that that right now is one of our hardest little sticking points trying to help our teachers come up with some ideas to do some things. Some examples, we go to the high school, um, because the high school is our most complicated building. Um, what we're taking a look at, we are considering, and we're still in the process of um, working our way through the details, but possibly everything up here does not happen. I just want to forewarn you that this is what we're looking at at the moment. Because we're looking at going to the full-time eight-block schedule. For those of you that know, Wednesdays and Thursdays are block schedules, so our kids are already used to it. But we are thinking about doing that on a full-time basis during the duration of the pandemic. Um, awareness that we've got to deal with. Um, the reason? It reduces the number of times that we have the entire school out into passing periods, interacting with one another. We reduce that. The second thing that it does that allows us to come up with a fourth lunch instead of three lunches, which reduces how many people are in the cafeteria and allows us to have more spreading out in the cafeteria. It also allows us an additional period to work through some remote learning issues and being able to work with some kids because the quarantine can't be there. And that block schedule gives us that opportunity, at least for those who don't have the zero hour, um, to be able to work through those kinds of situations. During lunch, it's going to be kind of a throwback. They did this in middle school. They did this in elementary school. It's been a while since they've done it in high school. Our ninth graders won't be affected because they won't know any different, but our 10th and 12th graders will. They're going to go change you to going back and sitting down at the table and getting released to go to the lunch line so that we can reduce how many people are up on the line at any one time. What we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce gatherings. We're trying to give them more opportunities to stay spread apart. We're trying to reduce, if one person gets it, it's a small group of people that may have been exposed instead of larger groups that may have been exposed. Not doing these things increase the chances of having to shut the school down or increasing the chances of having larger numbers of kids that need to be formed. What we're trying to do is just keep creating smaller groups so that we have fewer kids affected if there is a case. We will, at the high school level, definitely be wiping down shared equipment. So for example, when they go into the CAD lab, the first thing they'll do is wipe down their workspace before they begin working, and the last thing they do before they leave is wipe down the workspace before they leave. So if they wipe down their space before they leave, why do they have to do it when they start? because you don't know what happens from the time that they left until the next person comes in, because it'll be a lot of unattended at that time since our teachers will be in the hallway helping monitor out the hallway. Um, so you don't know the kid walked by and sneezed just at the time when they were walking past the computer or whatever the case might be. So that's the reason why you wipe it down when you start, wipe it down at the end, to try to make sure that we've taken care of that. We'll also be setting up hydration stations. Um, these are touchless. That will allow them to refill water bottles. We will be shutting down our, our uh, water fountains for one year. Um, and then we will work with an engineer on how to restart those back up next, next summer safely. And that comes into place. We've already checked into this. There's many other schools that have actually been doing this for a long time. So there's a chance we may or may not be starting the, the water 
help us back up anyway. But um, this is something that they're taking a look at. They're also considering and working with some schools that have eliminated lockers. There's some schools that already did this a long time ago. We're learning from them to find out if that's a viable option here as well, because it reduces safety collaborations of people while they're waiting at their locker and going back and forth with the locker. The more we can just keep people moving um, instead of stopping and congregating and creating mass groups, the better off we're going to be because it reduces how many people get in a quarantine situation. So those are some things that we're looking at at reducing it. Personal protective equipment. The Allen County Department of Health has come out and supported schools for doing this. Basically, it was a short answer. You have the kids wear the mask, you'll have fewer cases. If you have fewer cases, we're going to have fewer times we have to talk about quarantining kids. This has been confirmed by our, the doctors we've been working with and the physicians. It's the reason why it's become old hat when you go to a hospital, you see lots of people wearing masks. That's the reason. It helps prevent or slow the spread of this. Um, does not 100% stop it, but it greatly reduces it. As a part of that, we've got to find times during the school day where people can take a break and get away from it. So we're trying to work out those details so that we can create those opportunities to take the mask off and regain some We will continue to work on that. For the most part, the mask will be worn during public spaces, in public spaces, and when we cannot be six or more feet apart. That's basically what it amounts to. That's the general rule. We will not be requiring it during physical exertion, high physical exertion areas. We've been working with our medical experts in the NPE, they're running the mile, they will not have to wear a mask. Those would be examples where it would be exempted. And there may be spaces when we're outdoors where it's exempted as well, it just depends on the activity and the kind of spacing that's going on, as well as the weather conditions. You know, windy days are different than mountain days. We have to take all those things into factors and so forth. And we are becoming we're learning a lot thanks to our medical folks helping us understand when it's a factor that doesn't matter, when it's a factor that does make a difference. In terms of K-5, to we are still working out what makes sense from this area. We do know that they'll be wearing the mask on the buses. And one of the reasons why they'll be wearing the mask on the buses is nearly half of our bus drivers are retirees who are part of the higher vulnerability. And we want to make sure that we keep our bus drivers well, especially when we have so few and we're struggling to find enough bus drivers. And that's been a struggle for us for some time. But in terms of the specifics around that, I talked about the, the high school or the middle school kids where it's less than six feet and it's in public spaces. But the elementary kids, we're working with some pediatric doctors to find out what makes sense from this area. Because what we don't want to do is have the teacher spend more time working with the kid wearing the mask and less, instead of working with teaching and health. The important thing is teaching them how to read. We'll figure out the stuff with the mask, and that's why we're working with our pediatric doctors to find out what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. But we don't have that yet. We're still working on it. I also want to let you know that we will have some other PPE that we'll be looking at that is specific to the particular job. People who work with speech language pathologists are an example. What they do requires a different level of personal protective equipment because they're teaching kids how to form words with their mouths. They use a lot of modeling and examples. It's what they do. It's also not done from 10 feet away. It's usually done very close. As they, that's what speech language pathologists do. They help kids learn how to formulate sounds in a way that helps them navigate the English language better. It, it's a complicated process. It's more complicated than we think. Those of you who have had someone struggle with communication, you know how hard it is. Those of us who have not, it's more difficult for us to understand what they do. But that's an example where there's going to be different levels of protect, personal protective equipment depending on the specific activity that we're talking about. Questions for any of the board members. This isn't everything. The document's much longer than that. This is just a summary. And we're still working our way through it. There's a couple of things in there that may or may not happen because we're still working our way through there. But I just wanted you to be aware of some of the things that we're, what we're looking at. And we're modeling a lot in terms of learning, not just from CDC and Indiana State Department of Health and Indiana Department of Education, 
We're also learning from other schools that have already had their plans approved from other health departments. And we're also taking a look at what's working in, in um, places like Germany and Denmark and places where they've been open. We're trying to figure out what did they do to open and stay open. Um, there's still not a lot of data out about that because they were near the end of the school year when they went back, so there wasn't like long periods of time. We're also trying to learn from those places and find out what they did not do in the places where they opened and they had to shut back down. And there's some countries where that's happened as well. And we tried to learn you know, what not to do in those situations. So that's one of the advantages for being a labor starting school like we are, because we have the advantage of reading those plans and still incorporating those into our plans. What have we done up to this point? We do continue to delay all the field trips. It's looking like I'm probably going to cancel all field trips for the first couple months of the school year, just simply because we're not going to have enough information to be able to make decisions. But we're going to do this as, I'm going to do this in segments so that if conditions change, if we learn information that allows us to take some of the field trips in the future down the road later in the school year and do it safely, we have the option of doing that. But at the beginning of the year, they're probably going to be canceled at the beginning of the year if we continue to learn. Um, and those adjustments. So I just want you to be aware of that. At your last board meeting, you allowed us to open on a limited basis. I wanted to give you an update. We haven't started summer sessions too. We're in our second week. Not going good so far. Going okay. Um, we've also opened up some athletics. We've also had some camps again so far. We're having some success. But there are places in other parts of the state where they have had some issues and they kind of shut things down. And we're learning from those situations so that maybe there's some things that we can do to avoid some trouble. Our school psychologists have resumed the school, the testing for special education. Those were on delay. Those are now opened back up now that the governor's order allows us to open our school site, which is again why we're here today is because the order has allowed us to open our school sites. Up until July, we were not able to have a meeting like this in public because the facilities were closed. We've also resumed the extended special ed. Every year, there are a few kids that within their IEP has some extended learning that goes into the summer. Those were put on hold. Those have resumed now that the buildings have opened back up. And then marching band actually began today. So that's... That's a big activity. It's one of the things we work very closely with a number of physicians to try to figure out how to do that safely. And I thank um, band directors, Zagasel and Bill Frazier for their willingness to open and the research they did. They did a lot. They didn't wait for us to tell them what to do. They did a lot of reaching out and learning on their own and, and bringing some materials to us and having them reviewed by our, our medical uh, professionals to help them work their way through that. I also need to let you know that we do that cancel the summer choir activities, and that was because the review of that information is that they still needed more information and it was still deemed to be a high-risk activity. We have not closed the choir down for the year. We have only closed the choir down for the summer. While to buy our medical professionals more time to look up more information to find out whether or not it's an activity that we can do and if it is, how we can do it safely. Um, obviously, there's a lot of documentation about the fact that there are some flyers in other parts of the country where it was a super spreader activity where it spread to lots of different people. There's some hypotheses as to how that happened, and they're trying to help us figure out how to navigate that um, for our kids. That brings us to tonight, but before I go there, is there any questions? What I presented to you tonight is a resolution to take the next step. That next step is to give me the authorization to go ahead and move forward with finalizing the plans, finishing that process, but not just doing it for on-site only, but doing it for on-site and remote learning so that we can give our kids, our parents, the choice that makes sense for their particular children. I also want to let you know that I am recommending that that choice be for one semester so that there's a commitment to it so that we can figure out what we need to do from a staffing perspective so that we can also try to make that as small as possible so we can live within the means, the, the few means that we have. 
I also want to let you know that it also includes a limited waiver. Basically, what that limited waiver does is that if there are some special conditions that we need to take into consideration about someone who's on remote running, participating in an extracurricular activity, it gives them the opportunity of appealing that and going through a process where we can learn about that and determine whether or not it's possible or it makes sense. But what it does not do is it does not allow a person to displace a situation where we cannot follow through and keep other kids safe or, or put us in a position where the activity can't happen because of something. We want to make sure that that's taken into account. So what we've done in a limited situation where it allows us to get a little bit more information, dig a little bit deeper before we make the decisions whether or not it's appropriate or not appropriate. Because of our policy that says you need to be on on-site instruction, it does require us or to give you that flexibility to take a look at those things. This is also limited to only during the pandemic. It will, it, it stops when the pandemic stops. It is written in such a way that it does not go on beyond that. It only does it for that period of time. Questions about the resolution? <clears throat> With that being said, I recommend approval of the resolution that has presented. We do have a motion for approval of the resolution for next steps on the real meeting process. Move for approval. First, second, and second. Any questions or comments by anyone on the board? I do understand it's been a fairly long process, of course. It's been a long process. I appreciate also hearing the concerns from the board about the process and taking the time into consideration. I guess I'd also ask the teachers and parents, everyone involved, uh, realize that we're living with some flexibility here, and so we need to try to do our best to uh, how they are going to move forward. I would, also, I would also, if I, if I may, yeah. I just want to add and build on what you just said. Our pediatricians are not going to let us open if we can't fix this. And our pediatricians are very active in that regard, and some of those pediatricians have relatives that are staff members, and some of those pediatricians have kids that are in there. They have a vested interest in it because we do this the right way. And I believe that if it wasn't possible to do it the right way, they would be screaming at us to stop instead of helping us try to problem solve. All right. Any other questions or comments? We'll go to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's carried. And that takes us into I want to complete on this one. Now that you've done this, I just want to give you one thing. Here's what's left. What we're going to do is we will review the current plans that we've had. We've had to change them multiple times. We're going to review them, get them finalized. We are in the process of creating some educational materials to share with parents and teachers. Those are being done by our physicians that we've been working with. We are going through the statutory requirement discussion with the exclusive representative. And then when we are done, we're going to send to the Allen County Department of Health. You, in your resolution you just approved, you've made that one of the conditions that I have to take to the Allen County Department of Health. And lastly, we will bring more information to you at the next one. Thank you for letting me do that. No problem. <laughs> All right, now to item number four, uh, some recommended contract renewal. Uh, I'll be presenting this item, so I'll be making a motion for presentation. Um, as a result of the economic uncertainty due to COVID-19, uh, the superintendent and the board now desire to modify the 2021 contract such that we will convert the one year the increase for the 2021 uh, uh, salary increase to be moved to a stipend instead of the salary increase. That stipend will be paid out half prior to the year end of 2020, and then the rest was paid out uh, January 1st, 2021. So I recommend that for approval. Do I have a second? Okay. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. So with that, we'll turn it over to Mr. Mallory for approval. Thank you. I do have a few items to present. Uh, first one is our uh, approved service report for uh, heading into next school year. And um, in your packet was financial information for your review as well. Um, we did operate last school year at a loss of 136000 um, which is 
probably expected with our final two and a half months of, of uh, revenue restrictions, I guess, is the way I would phrase that. Um, with that said, uh, it enclosed is a, a, also a calculation that I always present to you by the USDA on uh, our price increase for our uh, lunches. And um, with that said, uh, in here, I've got a breakdown of all elementary, middle school, and high school, all lunch, uh, lunches to be increased, as well as breakfast uh, increased uh, prices. The other thing that I'm uh, requesting uh, tonight is also approval of uh, renewal of our bids uh, with our um, suppliers. Um, that being dairy uh, is the Dairy Farmers of America, food and supplies is for food service, and bread and bakery is alpha bakery. Um, with, with that said, um, certainly food service faces uh, similar challenges that other areas of education will be faced with heading into the next school year. Um, our food service department is working on uh, protocols as well to help with what we're faced with. Um, I think we'll see a lot of decrease in our uh, offers of our cart. Uh, it'll be more of handing <coughs> the, the, the food to students versus uh, large congregation areas where they can browse and kind of look and, and, and grab different items. All cart items uh, make a lot of money too. So that uh, I think will uh, affect the operation and financial condition of the service department as well. So uh, with that said, I do recommend both the prices and the um, vendor bids as presented. Uh, I, I think we have in the past, I certainly can still go to the Correct. I have a motion for approval. Move for approval. Any further questions or comments regarding the food uh, service report? Uh, price that we need in the fiscal Go ahead. I don't have the actual document in front of me, but these are the lowest bids, correct? You said you put out for bid? We actually uh, they honored uh, their bids from a year ago, and so we're just renewing the bid. Okay. And, then, and if you recall, we continue with the consortium that we organized with a year ago. Um, if you recall, I brought that. Uh, that consortium agreement to you. So um, the, the entire consortium is uh, going to the same people. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, one other follow up the $136,000 loss. Is there any recoverability within the CARES Act on that? It won't be within the CARES Act. However, there is potential possibly through FEMA. And so we have documented our expenditures and we're just kind of going through the next processes of what we need to do to file a claim. I would also say that I think there are some provisions with this that may be coming from additional things. You know, Congress is debating about potential funding to help us reopen more safely. There's a potential there may be something there, but it's, it's Congress and it's in the middle of debate, so I don't know whether it be hopeful or discouraged. Depends probably on which minister I'm talking to. Any other questions or comments regarding the, uh, the food service report? Hearing none, let's go to vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Next item is corporation purchases. Uh, I do have them itemized there in the packet um, from, from some various funds. Total corporation purchases is $300,957.74. I do recommend. Was by Mr. Collier. Any questions or comments regarding on the corporation purchases? I see a couple of these things I believe will be a little further out, depending once we finish the uh, school season or the, the fall season. Some of this other stuff we've purchased and the movement of certain things out there will occur after that season's over. Um, um, correct. And, and specifically, maybe if we're talking about furniture for the new school, or I was actually talking about uh, moving bleachers and setting up new furniture right. bleachers that will go after the season. That, that, that is correct. Um, demo on the new or on the old won't start until after the season. 
around November-ish time. And so that's correct. And now these vendors will be able to coordinate with the construction uh, timeline. Any other questions or comments on corporation purchases? All, right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> Motion carried. Motion uh, payments uh, to recommend total of $8,389.61 is recommended. Second, Mr. Falker. Any questions or comments on the, the payment of uh, corporation payments? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Mallers. We will now go into claims and payroll stuff. Do I have a motion for approval? Approval. Second. Motion by Mr. Marcus, second by Ms. Hathaway. Any questions or comments of any items found in the payroll? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's not additional. It's simply paying the, the bill that was a, uh, the training that was approved before. Now they've invoiced us because we've done the training in this versus out of one of the fun, other funds. You have to have our operating or education funds as opposed to. Bond issues. Correct. That's why it's in our normal payments. It's in our normal claims, yeah. Any yeah. questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Now I go to closing items. Board comments. Uh, first, I'd like to send the board's condolences to Corey Lamler. Lamler? Lamley, sorry. Uh, and her family for recent passing of her newborn son. Uh, our thoughts and prayers are with you with all, uh, all of the time. Uh, second, I'd like to thank everyone involved with the graduation ceremonies that were held last uh, week. Um, I know it wasn't a perfect condition for everyone, but reading some of the parents' comments uh, of appreciation and how much they enjoyed uh, letting their, their children get back together was at least a subset of their classmates for one of the ceremonies. Uh, get to walk across the stage and or across the, the policy floor, get their diplomas, uh, and their family being able to watch on live stream was a, was a, was a nice uh, conclusion to their, their high school careers and, and their peers. And what I can tell the students very much enjoyed it and were happy with the situation. So, again, I congratulate and thank you for your contribution to that solution. Any other board members with comments? All right, any from the audience who are willing to address the board? Yeah, I also want to, um, I'm going to keep it shorter than normal since we already talked, but our prayers do go out for um, this chapter and this family who, who lost loved ones. Um, we are very happy about the graduation. The feedback um, after the graduation has been very positive. And I can tell you that the smile on the faces of the kids who passed me at the graduation um, definitely made the entire process a little bit. Um, I also want to say a little note about our retirees. I want to thank Jennifer Barnes, who had been a, a school psychologist um, for many years. Um, she's relocating to be closer to family. Um, Sandy Graham, who has driven a bus way before I started working here, and she has done there's a lot of kids. She's she served a lot of kids, and I think we're up to grandkids. Uh, people that she's riding the bus for, and we just thank her for her service. Um, Neil Cromeyer has, I think, grown up at the Arco building. Um, we thank him for all of his service. Um, and then we also want to thank Diane McKee, who has been teaching PE. And I, I do want to make special note of Diane. She has been one of the people who's been instrumental behind Chargers fighting cancer. And she's been one of the staff members that has helped make that a success. And, and it needs to be noted that her, her work in that particular organization was very worthwhile. She's left with a big legacy that, that's going to carry on. Um, I, I just don't see that going away. Those kids have had fun with that. And that's something that we're very proud of. We thank her for all her years of service. Thank you. And with that, do I have a motion for adjournment of the board meeting? Second. Mr. Felker, Mr. Parker, 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 Mr.